I'm Dr. Craig Eskude, the host of IDD Health Matters, a podcast where we talk about health, wellness, and health equity for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Hope you enjoy it. The IDD Health Matters podcast is a joint production between Friends for Life and Intellect Ability. For more information, go down into the show notes and click the link where it says learn more here. Welcome to today's episode of IDD Health Matters. Our guest today is Ann Hardiman. Welcome, Ann. Uh, well, I'm happy to be here, Craig. So we're coming to you today from the New York Alliance for Inclusion and Innovation, and Ann has a big role in that organization. Tell us about it. Yeah, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer, and I like to say I do the fun things, and Michael C. Ryder, the president, does the other things, but... <laughs> Um, I'm working on some fabulous grants and um, other this conference as an example. So, yeah, so it's good. I want to hear more about that. But first, tell me how you got into this field. So it could be a long story or a shorter story, but um, I my mother was bipolar. And so this is the longer story, but I'll try to keep it shorter. <laughs> okay. And um I, of course, that affected our whole family and, of course, her, but I think I was attracted to human services and the field after that, and she had a psychiatrist that she loved and uh, that treated her very well. She was hospitalized periodically, but, um, you know, I think that started my interest in psychology. That's what I studied, and I got my master's in um, community psychology. And the belief system there is that mental health issues should be able to be treated in the community as best as um, possible, and that's where resources should be. And I still believe that. Mm -hmm. I do know there's medical and complex issues that arise, and you need um, something more inpatient or more uh, so, team oriented yes. service at times and but it's true for all of us, absolutely right? but that hopefully there can be steps down and community can w where the person is most comfortable and can be supported happens so that's that's kind of where um, my belief system mm -hmm. was and I studied it in, and got my master so after that I worked in a child protection area and um, that was very hard, um, uh, abuse and neglect of kids. And so I was looking around for something different and came to a residential program that was brand new for people with IDD. And um, in New York, uh, we were closing developmental centers or it, there was a court um, decree to decrease the numbers in developmental centers every year. And so residential programs and apartments and day um, day programs were just blooming and it was really nice to be in that beginning place with people coming from developmental centers um, where things had gotten to be pretty pretty much our belief is they shouldn't exist yeah shouldn't let's, exist let's, let's say, yeah, yeah very challenging stay on stay on the positive side yeah, thing, yeah. things there there certainly are some some challenges um, that arose uh, in terms of supports and services and healthcare and all of these things in institutional settings. And we have, we have, we've, when we talk about what, when, you know, that transition you were talking about, that we, we kind of call that often, often you hear the term deinstitutionalization, moving people out of larger institutions into community based settings. And, you know, I, I like to compare things to what everybody would want. How many of us would choose to live in a large setting with multiple other people um, that, you know, or you kind of have a schedule that you have to follow and everybody has to do the same thing at the all time at, at the same time? Yep. You know, would we choose that for our lives? And most likely the answer is no. And people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are just like the rest of us. And they want independence. They want um, to be able to choose things that they enjoy in life and do them when they want to do them, right? Exactly. They may need a little different level of support, but we all need support for yep. at, at the different times in our lives. And so the idea is moving people out of these larger institutions and into community-based settings. And, you know, one day these podcasts are going to be reaching people that have never heard of an institution. That'll be a good yeah, place it, it, to be. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So 
What kind of things did you see? You said you were you were at, you were working in this field as people were moving into community based settings. Did you see any notable changes in people who moved out from an institution into a community setting? Just very notable uh, changes where people felt um, like they weren't any different anymore they weren't segregated they were people they were um, many people wanted to get a job and of course that was something that we could capitalize on and that the community benefits from when people when people are able to get a job on the other hand they're on the job sometimes people with disabilities are bullied or not included in the lunch or the fun schedule later so there's still acceptance issues um Again, we have work to do. We have a way to go. We have a we've way come, to go. We've yeah. come a long way. Yeah. And it's I would say it's moving in the right direction. Still lots of challenges. Now, specifically related to health, health issues, medical care, did you have any, or, or what did you see happening as people moved from institutional settings into community-based settings? Well, a large one, I think, was people had not been treated well for their health issues when they were uh, in an institution. Many, in many cases, um, the dental care was just to pull teeth. So that was, uh, that's, that's a sad, you know, happening. And um, people had um, things that were ongoing that maybe they wouldn't have had to have had um, bad habits like smoking because we reinforce people, we, uh, the big we, in institutions with cigarettes, you know. Um, well, that yeah. that was that was after my time. Okay, we that's didn't good. Do that, but. Good. <laughs> so that so then you have a person addicted to smoking, maybe, and um, you sort of created that in that in that setting. Um, we also had definitely in the community doctors that perhaps weren't as familiar with um, with a person with intellectual and developmental disabilities and the communication issue potentially. And of course, staff acted on their behalf um, or the family. Um, There were doctors that maybe were less able doctors that accepted Medicaid and some of the maybe more skilled doctors did not. There's a lot of paper process and a lot of inequity in the Medicaid program, I think, for the physicians, um, et cetera. So he didn't always get the highest quality doctor. I, I, as, as a physician, I can't disagree with that because I know with the level of training I had uh, in providing healthcare to people with disabilities, which was zero yeah. uh, early on my, in my career, I would not have been a very good provider of healthcare for people with disabilities as well whether I took Medicaid or not. I, I don't know that that is as much of a differentiator than it's just the fact that many health uh, training programs don't provide education in this field. And sometimes it's, it's, you might agree with this, sometimes it's they don't even know that they need to be doing this and, or why they should be doing this. Um, because, you know, I, I, again, I didn't think I needed that training until I set foot into a residential program providing sports and services and was responsible for health care for people and realized I wasn't very, I didn't, wasn't sure exactly what I was doing. So I spend, spent a lot of time learning from nurses and other clinicians that have been in that field. And that's why I'm so passionate right now about trying to see what we can do to improve training and education for students and also for clinicians already in practice. Yeah. I totally agree with that. And also the maybe more time able to be spent with a patient that is a person mm-hmm. with intellectual and developmental mm-hmm. disabilities. Um, you know, a person with a physical disability just may need more time, more time getting on an examining table and et cetera. So, and, yeah. and, and time is one of the challenges because also coming from the physician standpoint, we know that we there's a lot of patients to see and maybe we don't feel like we can take the time sometimes. But I can promise you there are different things that can be done to, to help people with, with various levels of disabilities have a better healthcare experience uh, and, and get the healthcare that they need. And it's probably not as hard or challenging as, as we often think it is. It's just a matter of, of being open and, and being willing and, and being interested in helping everyone 
have access to a, a basic level of competent healthcare, which I think is something that we should all all strive for. Definitely, we should all strive for. I think there's a um, also a bit of a overuse of medication sometimes. Um, and um, we call that polypharmacy is a term you you're familiar with it, and our audience may not be, but but it's a term that describes lots poly meaning a lot of pharmaceuticals, lot, lots of medications, lots of drugs. And we, we, we know that people with intellectual and de- developmental disabilities are often on many medications, yes. sometimes two or three in the same class that has significant uh, interaction potential, can cause uh, you know significant side effects. Uh, and, and that can be a challenge. Sometimes they're needed. Medications have many great benefits, um, but we have to always balance that with the, the risks as well. And the appropriate need. Sorry. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that I think any regular person on the street, sometimes there are different medications that work for them and not another. And when there may be some communication or lack of under awareness of your body and what's happening and the staff are observing and doing well, but not in that person's shoes, that sometimes maybe there's prescribing and trying um, that's more because you don't get the feedback maybe that you need. And, and that's a challenge on the healthcare side. It, it, it's it's a negative, but it's a challenge for healthcare providers as well too when you don't get the feedback, when a person that you start on a medication can't tell you, ooh, um, you know, every time I take this medicine, I get a really upset stomach, so I, I really don't feel like eating. Can we go to a different mm-hmm. medicine? You may not see that in a person who doesn't use words to communicate, but what you may see is that person starts refusing to eat. Yep. They might even become aggressive yep. around meal times, and it's not because they have a disability. It's it may be because they're having a side effect from one of the medications or a bunch of other things that could be going on. And those are the things that that clinicians need to learn and understand. It's not you, should, you know I, I I talk about this a lot. It, it's not we don't have to teach clinicians how to treat most of these medical problems like aspiration pneumonia. Doctors know how to treat that. Constipation, they know how to treat that. It's how they appear differently in people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and how these behaviors are often forms of communication and not something to attribute just to the fact that the person has a disability. And I think um, we know, you know, that the workforce issues are big right now. So when you have less continuity in staff that are observing and documenting what's going on with someone that is not as able to communicate. And, um, you know, the observing is choppy because people are coming in and out on different shifts. Um, You know, it gets even more challenging when, um, you know, there's a medical or whatever, a mental health issue that needs to be um, addressed, but you have too many people not quite knowing that person well and you know so training in in that area is important as well too but when you have a lot of turnover it can be challenging to keep your staff always trained right yeah it's really really hard so i wish we could do better with staffing and uh raising those wages just to get my little plug in on that so that we could have a a staff that loves the work but also can stay because they're paid got to make a living as well too Um, making living is, is yeah, that, that we certainly have to do that, but this field can also be rewarding in a, in a lot of, lot of ways too. There are some incredible stories of staff that, um, we, during better times when we were face to face, we would have DSP conferences in every region in New York and people that have stayed as DSPs for 20, 30 years and are just so dedicated and know the people that they that they support um it's just high value i've been fortunate enough to know some of those people that spent 20 and 30 and some of them have 40 years in the, in this field as direct support professionals and they were incredible people um and uh i don't know it's 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 pretty neat to see that um so that kind of takes us through what where you are now and what you're doing and you kind of started at the beginning saying you were working on some very interesting projects Yeah, well, one of the big ones, and we're about to launch in May, is an executive leadership development series. Um, The New York Alliance has wanted to do this for a long time, and we always ended up back 
earning it for some reason, just something else became a priority. And we are launching a year long, um, 23 to 26 people. We have an incredible faculty teaching. Um, and uh, it's for executives now that maybe want to fine tune their skills um, or very soon to be identified people in the field. And it's very values based, very person centered, driven. And uh, we had a keynote today, Lakeisha Brown, who talked about person centered plans for staff too, which are really important and was kind of a light bulb for me. Nurturing your staff. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So um, we will be building in to a diversity, equity, and an inclusion um, aspect because that is a value of the New York Alliance too. So we're pretty excited. We think we have a good um, year-long trajectory of face-to-face and um, virtual sessions. And uh, we'll see. It's going to end at our conference next year where the first class will graduate Graduate. and uh, perhaps present if uh, they feel like it. So would you be able and willing to share a few topics that you think that you'll be teaching about? Yes. So the first um, two and a half days that are face-to-face, really, you talk about surfacing what your leadership skills are and um, how to to hone them, a little bit of history of, of leadership development. Throughout, we're talking about social and emotional intelligence. Um, we do, we want to bring in some of the, um, I guess, the more um, hard hard skills, finance, um, ethics, some corporate compliance. Um, so there's different virtual sessions um, every month. And what we're trying to build is a, 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 a network of, of the participants can rely on some friends, colleague friends, um, and um, between each session, we'll have kind of a mentoring co- coaching session with um, people that may have had some homework from the session before, and um, they may work on a project together, um, two or three people. So it's pretty exciting, I think. Um, we will have a uh, innovation and person-centered um, organization face-to-face session too, um, about halfway through. So, uh, I think our topics are good. We are probably skimming the surface on some of them, but others are digging in a little more deeply. Well, I, I think it's phenomenal, and a, a similar program like that, kind of dif- di- different, different, but sim- similar. Uh, I was able to participate in one of those years ago when I was working for the state in Mississippi, and it was a leadership development type program, and that really opened my eyes to to so many different aspects of this field. And and in you know, I was in my own little medical world field, and it really opened my eyes to the work that other people do, and it made. Me, or taught me how to do what I do better, um, and the com- camaraderie and the fellowship, like yep. you mentioned, yep. and and being able to call someone and say, "Hey, um, I'm not sure what to do here. Can you help me out? I bet you've faced this before. That's that's invaluable to yeah, have that it, in, in any totally. any work setting, but in particular in this field where we often feel kind of isolated, and there aren't many other people doing this. Or where do we find other people? And I know in the medical world, it's like that. You know, you're the doctor at a program or you're a nurse at a program and it's like, I don't know other nurses doing this. Clearly, we hope to build that in as a benefit and, um, oh God, I had another thought and it just escaped me. But, um, you know, we see, um, as we see leaders leaving the field, um, a less work-life balance that the next generations want and we don't always have that. During the pandemic, we had executives working shifts. There weren't enough staff. There weren't so, enough direct support staff, so the leadership was coming exactly. in to provide supports and services uh, for people. So I think we're trying to help people understand that agencies and their staff need a work-life balance. We're not going to get there immediately. There's such a commitment um, in this human services field, and not enough people maybe to go around yet, but. Would you say it's a great career to consider? You know I would. <laughs> it's um, it's 
it's been fabulous for me. Friends for Life Residential Care, specializing in support for individuals with developmental disabilities, offers services like adult day support and home health care. Emphasizing empowerment and quality of life, we live by the motto, my ability is stronger than my disability. We are currently hiring, welcoming those passionate about making a difference. Learn more and explore career opportunities at friendsforliferc.com. I'm Dr. Craig Eskide, President of Intellectability. State developmental disability agencies, managed care organizations, and providers across the United States use Intellectability's health risk screening tool, eLearn courses, and person-centered training to improve health equity for people with IDD. Visit ReplacingRisks.com to learn more about how you can employ these tools with people you support. So, Anne, I like to do this little thing I call three and three. It's in three minutes, tell the audience three things that you just like them to know. Uh, mm -hmm. Advice you can give them, uh, activities that they might participate in that can um advance the field of services and supports and health for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities? So three things. I don't know if it'll be three. Maybe it'll be you know four, what? but I just, um, that, just but talk. Anybody stick to yeah. it. So. Um, I have found it very rich in relationships um, at every level, and I'm not talking judging levels, but I have friends that are people with disabilities and DSPs and executives, board members. Connecting in the community is really um, important. You know, disability crosses all political lines and um, you're not sure, you know, um, you know, any family can uh, have a disability. And I've met some incredible people and I would say, tell your story. It's important. Um, one of the reasons I bring up the fact that my mother was bipolar, it did have an impact on me and our family, but I don't believe people talk about mental illness enough and so that it's not accepted. Her own mother, a third grade teacher, my grandmother, did not acknowledge her bipolar disorder um, and would she would kind of disappear. Um, during my mother's episodes, and she lived right next door to us. So it's an, it, it's, I just want more acceptance for people that have differences, if you want to put it that way. Um, how many did I cover, Craig? Anyway, I it's just I been, know, yeah. I, I didn't get rich, but it was an incredible career and still you is. Get right. financially. I didn't rich. get financially. That's true. But did you're get. a very rich person. Thank you. I appreciate Clear. that too. And thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom and your experiences with us. And thank you so much for being on this, this, this podcast. Me too. And more so for the work that you do in this. Thank field. you. I appreciate it. 